Welcome. Good to see you here. I see maybe, uh, thanks, Jim. <laughs> it's great to be together. Um, I see it's maybe a little sparse today. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, people probably out and about on vacation and traveling around. Um, it's that time of year, but hey, we're going to we're going to meet here today. We're going to make a joyful noise. We're going to praise our God and worship together. So will you stand with us? Let's sing it out this morning. Let's sing it to him. And I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. praise and treasures that fade are never enough and you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Nothing better than you. 
so much you take our guilt you take our shame you take our pride all the times that we've turned away from you Lord and when we turn around and repent and come back oh you show us so much grace you show us your love You redeem us, you restore us, you grow us into the men and women that we were first created to be when you knit us together, when you made us with so much care and so much love. Oh, God, we thank you. Paul writes to the Corinthians, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. That in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, Lord, we thank you for that grace that you give us. We praise you and we worship you. Such grace from the 
Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name yeah. Christ the seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil Christ the
he shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, just in his righteousness alone. For this to stand before the Savior, our Redeemer, our hope, our living hope, oh God. We thank you so much. We stand before you at the same time broken people, but day by day being restored and being built into the men and women that you made us, made us to be, that you created us to be. You made us for more, Lord, than walking around just floating around, just fulfilling what we want to do and who we want to be. You made us for more. You made us for a purpose. We thank you for showing us that today. We thank you for revealing yourself more and more to us as we seek you, as we look for you, as we read of you, as we dig into your word. You make us, Lord, who we are. You save us. God, we thank you. We bring our offerings now and our tithes. God, bless them. God, use them to show your love to people around us in this community, in this church, in the neighborhoods around, in the state, in the country, in this world. God, we want to spread your love. We want to spread your good news, the good, good news of you. Lord, thank you. Bless the rest of this service, God. Help us to learn more of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The ushers can come forward. children are, I think, probably ready to go to their service. Enjoy yourselves. Enjoy yourselves. Over the next few weeks, and, and actually including last week, we're going to be and have been talking about our mission statement. Last week, of course, Nigel kind of walked you through the whole mission statement and talked about how how it, would, um, how it would play out in small groups. And so I hope you got a ton out of that. It's, it's going to be part of, and that was sort of the beginning of, our 
discussion of, of the... I wonder if somebody would do me a favor and bring me a bulletin, please. Um, a discussion of the... Uh, oh, thanks. Perfect. Of uh, the mission statement. So I hope that you're, you're ready to... And the insert. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope you're ready to kind of walk through this. It's going to be a little bit of a different journey. We're going to be looking at um, we're going to be looking at each item, not so much from the perspective of of a teaching as an involvement. So that today we're going to be talking about your own personal involvement in becoming a disciple, but in, uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to have some, some reports from people who have been on the mission field to talk about messengers. We're going to be in, engaging in a, min, a ministry fair in a few weeks that's going to help us see the ministries of the church, learn more about them. Some of the things that you might not even know happen here, uh, but we'll be circulating among tables and looking at, at those things we're also, in two weeks, going to be having a worship service. I know you think we always have a worship service. This is going to be an expanded worship service, a longer time of worship. There will not be a message, per se. But be thinking about that and thinking about the, um, the ramifications of spending more time with music, spending more time in thinking about worship, thinking about God, and... Uh, I think you'll find it to be a meaningful experience. If you've, if you've attended some of our Chris, Christmas Eve services or, or our Maundy Thursday services, I think you'll find that these things, that this service will, will resemble those in many ways. So prepare your heart. That'll be in a couple of weeks. This morning, I want to talk a bit about the, uh, what it means to become disciples. We begin by thinking about Peter and his, his journey with Jesus, how he walked with him to the garden, how he had just made a bold declaration that he would, that he would go with Jesus to death. And Jesus, in, in some ways, corrected him, in some ways, prepared him for that. But there, along with the other apostles, as Jesus was attacked, taken prisoner, Peter fled. A little later on, that same, during that same time frame, he's standing out by the, by the fire warming himself and denies Jesus three times. Says he doesn't know him. And we wind up with this the sense that Peter has some way to go. He's been a disciple for a long time. He's been a, an apostle for years now, and, but he still has some ways to go. And when we come to the book of 2 Peter, we're seeing Peter at a later stage of life. He has a little bit more mileage on. He has a little bit more experience under his belt. And he's going to show us a process by which we can grow as disciples and come closer to Jesus step by step. Looking at 2 Peter in chapter 1. I'm, I'm going to begin with verse 4. Verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all the things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Sorry, I'm reading from the ESV, so it, there we go. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. 
For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I found it interesting as I was beginning to think through this series that, that I was able to look into the passages that you had suggested and find passages that, that actually align very well with the topics of the, of the mission statement, and this is one of them. And so here we are looking at what Peter describes as, as a progression, a repeating and building progression of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And it begins with faith. It all begins with faith. The faith that we need to be believers. Now, I don't know where you are in your walk with Christ. Some of you may have come to Christ fairly recently. Some of you may have been with Christ for decades, longer than me even. I expect there are some of you that way. But it all begins with that faith, and we have to have faith that Jesus is who He said He is, that He is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah, that He is our Savior, and we place our faith in Him and invite Him into our lives. And and if we don't have enough faith for that, Paul tells us not to worry because God will give us the faith for it. We're we're saved by grace and that grace is a gift. We don't have to work for it. But even if we don't have enough for that, he says it it comes through faith and, and even that is a gift of God. And so let me just invite you, if you're here today and you're thinking, this, this salvation thing, this following Jesus thing is something kind of new and different and I'm not sure and, and I'm trying to work out the pieces. Talk to Him. Let Him invest in you the faith that you need. And then respond to Him. Because that's where it all starts. With the faith that it takes to be a new believer. I want to grow in Christ. I want to walk with Him. And Peter says that's where it starts. It starts with faith. But surprisingly, it continues with virtue. See, I say surprisingly because we might say, I just came to Christ and I need to know what to do. But that's not what Peter says. Peter says, just do stuff. There was, there was this uh, Christian comedian some years back. I used to enjoy his, his work. He said, when Jesus comes again, I want to be doing something for God. I don't care if it's making mistakes. And, and, and I feel that way sometimes. And, and what Peter's telling us here is, Be doing something for God even if it's making mistakes. The best you can, the best you know, do what's right. That's what virtue is. And and maybe you'll get it wrong. Don't worry about that. God looks at the heart. He knows your motivations. He knows your intentions. He knows what it is that you're trying to do. So engage in it. Step into it. And, and maybe you'll make foolish mistakes, and okay, that's fine, we all do. But go ahead and do what's right. If you, if you used to, to steal, stop stealing and start giving to people instead, people in need. If you used to lie a lot, stop lying and start telling the truth. If, if you used to hate people, Explore what it means to love people instead. Start doing the good things that you know to do. And, and maybe because of your background, you'll have some skewed ideas of that, but that's okay because the next step is, not, is to not continue in making the mistakes, but the next step is to augment the good things that we're doing with knowledge. See, if we wait till we know everything that we need to do, we'll never do it because the Bible's a big book. It might be the thickest book that most of us will ever read. And hopefully, we'll read it multiple times in our lives, but even then, it's going, we'll, we'll have to go through and read it again because it's such a big book. And from the beginning, all the way to the end, God is telling us what are the good things to do. And so, we're never going to memorize all that. Not most of us. If you do, let me know. But we're never going to memorize all that. So we go through it again and again and again and we just saturate ourselves in it and we learn what it means to do good. What it means to please God. What, what are His commands that He gave us in Scripture? What, what 
about the law? What does it mean when it says that we should, that we should be getting closer to God in certain ways? And, and how does Jesus shift all that so that it applies to us today in the New Testament times? Learn. Learn. You might read the law of Moses and go, oh man, this is so old, this is so outdated, I don't even know how to apply some of this stuff because it doesn't make any sense. Go ahead and learn it anyway. And when you get to the New Testament, Paul will tell you, and Jesus will tell you, it's not about the letter of the law, it's about the spirit of the law. It's about doing what the law intends. And the only way you're going to know that is to saturate yourself in it. So get into the Word. And not just get into the Word, but also have yourself a spiritual mentor. If you don't have one, we can set you up. We have, we have a program here, and I would point her out, but I don't know where she's sitting. Um, we can, we can have, have you hooked up with somebody that's older, been around the block more times than you have, and you can learn from them, and they can help you to understand, based on their life experience, what, what's coming, what it is that, that are good things, what they are that are good things to do, and, and how you can engage those things. And add to the virtue that you were trying. While you're reading the Bible, you're going to learn things sometimes. You're going to go, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I've been doing this wrong. Let me, let me give you an example. You become a Christian. And you go, you know what? Every week I go to church and they pass this plate. We pass basket. And, you know, it must be a good thing for me to give in the offering. So, so you reach in your pocket and you pull out a $5 bill and you drop it in the offering. And you feel good about that. You're doing the right thing. You're giving in the offering. And that's great. And so, so you step into that, and then you're reading in the Bible, and, and you run across this word tithe, and, and you're asking yourself this question, what is that? I'd never heard that word before. So you look it up, and you find out that that means a tenth. And if, if you're applying that the way the Scriptures seem to be indicating as you read them, then you're not going to be giving a $5 bill every week. You're going to be giving a tenth of everything you make. Now, that's a dilemma. Here you are. That's hard. That's a lot of money. Well, you know, it, proportionally speaking, that's a lot of money. Am I supposed to really take a tenth of everything and give it to God? Can I do that? Can I even make ends meet if I do that? But you've learned. You had this virtue of giving to God, and then you've learned. You've added to your virtue knowledge, and knowledge told you there is an amount that God expects you to give. And so now you have a choice to make. Am I going to add that knowledge to my virtue with self-control? You see, self-control, this is where it comes in. Because as you read the Scriptures you're going to, and learn things, you're going to find some of these things that God is asking of us are hard. Some of them are counterintuitive. Some of them may come across to us as even a little bit crazy. God said, or Paul said, I'm, I'm a fool for Christ. And so you look at some of the things that God's asking you to do, you know, that's, just, that's just foolish. How can I even think about that? But, but Jesus is turning the whole world upside down for you. He's changing your perspective, taking you away from the world and giving you a heavenly view. And so it takes some self-control. You say, okay, I, I've, I've seen in the Scriptures what I need to do, and now I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Even if it's hard, even if I don't want to, I'm going to do it. And so using our, using our example, I'm going to give a tenth of, of my income this week and see what happens. That's what he asks of me. And there's more things, very difficult things. Let me just say, and, and I, I'm not judging anybody. I don't know your, your circumstances, but if you're living with somebody right now and you're not married and you're reading the Bible and you find that, that God expects you to be married, it's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be living with this person anymore. Or, you know, we're going to get married anyway. Well, maybe I shouldn't be living with them until we do. Or maybe that flirting that I'm doing at, in my workplace, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. And it's so much fun and everybody expects it and now everybody's going to think I'm weird and I'm holier than thou and it's going to be hard. And it's going to take self-control. And there are so many other things that you'll learn in the Bible and figure out, especially when you get to the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus is calling us to a high standard. And will we get it right all the time? No, I don't. 
Will, will we be able to get it right all at once? No, probably not. But that's why it's a progression. And we'll look more at that in just a few minutes. But we learn, after exerting that self-control and doing the right thing, that now it's going to take perseverance. It's going to take perseverance. It's not enough to do the right thing once. As much self-control as it takes, as hard as it might be, it's not enough to do it once. You have to do it all the time. You have to do it all the time. And make for ourselves life habits, life customs, things that we do as a matter of, of everyday occurrence. I sat with a guy one time and, and he was talking to us. He says, you know, I don't have to decide every Sunday morning whether I'm going to church. I've already decided that, decided that years ago. And so now I just do it. And, and maybe you struggle with that. Maybe, maybe there are things that you go, should I be doing this this week? Should I, be, may, should, should I give my tithes? Should I go to church? Should I read the Bible today? Should I, should I go to my small group meeting? Should I, should I, should I, Should I take out the trash? The answer, by the way, is yes. And it's, and it's this habit that we form. Good habits to replace the old. Any farmer in the room will tell you that if you want good things to grow, you have to pull the weeds out and let the good things take over or the weeds will choke it out. If you have bad things in your life, you have to get them out of there and let, let the good things grow. And choke out the weeds. I wish it worked that way. So we persevere, persevere in good attitudes and good behavior and make them into the habits of our lives. And then Peter says that we have to add something else. And this something else is a little harder. It's a little more difficult. And you thought it was getting difficult already. It's, it's a little more vague. Godliness. What is godliness? Isn't all this stuff we've been talking about godliness? Well, it depends. Most of the stuff that we've been talking about are behavioral. They, they speak of the things that we do. And if we step into things just doing them because we're supposed to, that's not quite going to cover everything. What we're being told that we need to do here is do them the way God wants them done. Do them as God would do them. Every one of you, every single one of you, whether you're in this room or online, you are created in the image of God. You bear about with you the creativity, the capacity for good, the capacity for eternal life, that the only way that you can actually access that capacity is through the Lord. You bear that about with you. Now, in the fall, whenever you were reading the Bible and you got to chapter 3 of Genesis, you saw that humankind fell and, and embraced sin as a way of life. At that point, those things became hard. But if we embrace doing things that God wants done for the reasons that God wants done, then we're, we're kind of re-accessing re the image of God within us. Paul talks about allowing ourselves to be made into the image of Christ. That's the same thing. So we read the Gospels and we see what Jesus has to say about prayer. And we see what Jesus has to say about giving. And we see what Jesus has to say about lust and hatred and all these things. And, and we go, I need to access those things. But it's not enough for me to just not do them. I have to ask the question, why is Jesus saying this? Why is God holding this up as a standard for my life? And that's godliness. That's saying, God, I don't want to just do the right thing. I want to be like you. And there's obviously things about God that we can never be. We can never be all-powerful. I know some of us would like to be. That's all right, you can't. We can never be all-knowing. I wish I was sometimes, and then sometimes I'm glad I'm not. But God's moral goodness, God's love, 
God's mercy, God's justice, and that, that huge tall order that he gives us, be holy because I am holy. Those are the things that we're trying to access to embrace godliness. When we come to these last two, brotherly affection and love, they might look like the same thing. They're not. And, and it's odd because under normal circumstances, I would say when you run into these two words or these two ideas in the Greek, and I don't usually do this because I know just about enough Greek to get myself in trouble, but, but in the Greek, you've got two words going on here, phileo and agape. And the first one, phileo, is from which we get that very important word, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Brotherly love, mutual affection. The first thing that Peter is telling us that we need to engage here is love each other like a brother. I've heard people try to diminish this and say this is not this is not a big deal. This is not this is kind of you know just like kind of liking somebody. It's not. Under normal circumstances phileo and agape are are synonyms. But but it is a, a human love. Can I love you like a brother. Can you love me like a brother? Can I love you like a sister? On a very human level, can I be kind to you? Can you be kind to each other? Can you serve each other? Can you you go out of your way to get together with each other? This is how we go with family. When family is functioning well, and I know not all families do, and, and sometimes it's difficult But, you know, if we're going to be like a family, sometimes it'll be difficult. Can I go out of my way to get together with you? Can you go out of your way to to express kindness to each other? That's brotherly affection. And and anybody can do that. People in the world do that. Non-Christians do that. You get close to a friend, uh, it says in in Ecclesiastes or or Proverbs, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We can know people on that level. And they may or may not be related to us, but we can be that close to them. And this is something that anybody can access, anybody can do. But Peter is telling us that for the Christian, it's essential. It's not optional. If we're going to move the next step beyond, beyond godliness, if we're going to going to make meaningful all of those other things that we've been accessing, then we have to step into that. And I have to love you as simply and basically as I can. But then we come to that last word, love. Normally, I would say these two words, they're, they're synonyms. But in this case, Peter is placing them against each other. He's, he's, he's saying this is a progression. One is greater than the other. And agape is. Agape is that word. God so loved the world, go ahead, that he gave. But have everlasting life. That's how much God loves you. It is a holy, self-sacrificing love. It is a love that goes beyond the norm. It is a deeper, more intense love that says, it doesn't matter what happens to me. as long as the love that God expects from me is expressed to you. Two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's that word. That's that word. After Jesus rose from the dead, he was walking with with Peter along the beach. 
And he says, Peter, do you love me? Agape. And Peter says, well, yes, Jesus, you know I love you. Phileo. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Agape. Peter says, yes, Jesus, I love you. Phileo. And Jesus says, take care of my lambs. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Phileo. And the Bible says that Peter was grieved that it had come to this. Yes, Jesus, you know everything. You know that I love you. Phileo. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. When Peter weighs phileo, off against agape. When he weighs phileo, a brotherly, natural love that we can have for each other, off against agape, a selfless, godly love. He knows what he's talking about. He's been confronted with it. He's been confronted with it by somebody who knows his heart. And there we are. We find ourselves coming to this point and, and saying, have, have, I, have I done this? Have I stepped through this, this whole process? Because when you have, you're not done. And that's what Peter says in, in the end of this passage in verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing... And thus the picture on the front of your bulletin, that, that stairway that you just keep going and keep going and keep going and you keep going up the stairs and up the stairs and up the stairs and never get to the top. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a lifelong journey. We get there and when we get there, we say, I can love the way God loves. I have demonstrated it to myself. Have I done it perfectly? No. Have I done it completely? No. But I've gotten there do I have enough faith for God to build that in me more? And if I do, can I step off of that love and exercise the virtue that comes out of that love? And when I do, can I get back into the Scriptures and talk to my spiritual mentor and find out more clearly what that means? And when I find out more clearly, can I exert the self-control that it takes for me to actually get in there and do it? And whenever I've done that, can I then persevere and continue and continue and continue and make that level of love and that level of virtue a matter of habit, something that takes us to the next level. And once I've been doing that, can I then reaccess what God's personality, what his character is like, and say, How in the world? God, how in the world do you do it? And once we've done that, can we then enter into that brotherly affection in a new and more powerful way? And can we enter into that love on a higher plane and then start all over and start all over and start all over? This is what it means to become a disciple. My guess is that when you think about your life and you think about these particular kind of, kind of levels of, of, of discipleship, you think, well, in one place in my life, I'm here, but in another place in my life, I'm there. And, and at first you might go, well, that might make me a hypocrite. No, it just means that you've got some work to do. Being a hypocrite would be saying, no, I'm all the way up here and all those things, and, and you know, I'm good and I don't have anything else to do. No, that'd be being a hypocrite. Trying to come off like you have something that you don't have. 
But if, but if you're looking at it and going, well, at work, I'm, I'm here. But at home, well, not so much. Well, perhaps what that means is that in both places, you have to progress to the next level, but you've got to give some special attention to the place where you're not as advanced. And work on it a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. I'd like you to take the insert that I gave you the blue insert, and just ask yourself the question, and, and do yourself a favor, be nice to yourself, say, where, where I am the best Christian I can be, maybe that's at work, maybe it's at home, maybe it's when you ride in your carpool, I don't know where that is, but, but whatever that is, where I'm the best Christian I can be, where am I here? Am I exerting self-control? To speak with others graciously and kindly and, and with clean language and with generosity. Am I, am I persevering in that? Do I do it sometimes but not sometimes? Is this a habit that I need to make? Or maybe you're going, you know what, I've been, I've been around these people a long time, but I don't know that I've ever asked myself the question of whether or not I love them. Do I? Does my life bear it out? And, and if not, what can I do to express love? And, and again, be nice to yourself. Just start small. Brotherly affection. Start small. And, and do whatever it takes to express to those people or th that person, you know what? We're closer than average. I, I like you. In fact, I feel kind of like you. You're a brother or a sister to me. You know, I have to say that in so many words every time, but, but do things that demonstrate it. And, and then go the next level. And continue and continue and continue. I give you this as a worksheet to kind of help you uh, pinpoint some of those things. And I hope that that's helpful to you in becoming a disciple of Christ. This morning we have walked all the way around Peter's last days with Jesus. We've talked about Gethsemane and his desertion of Christ. We've talked about Jesus' crucifixion and, and Peter's denial of Christ. And we've talked about after his resurrection and Jesus' reinstatement of Peter. But if we take one step earlier, I want to invite Nigel, come on up here, please. If we take one step earlier, we see a moment in time where Peter has this, this kind of moment with Jesus. As Jesus walks into the upper room where the apostles have gathered and takes off his, his cloak and puts on a towel and gets down and starts washing their feet. And he gets to Peter and Peter says, no, 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 no. You, you, you can't wash my feet. You can never wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't do this, we're not even together. And Peter says, all right, wash my head, wash my hands, give me a bath. That last part's my own translation. That little moment with Peter happens at the table just before the Last Supper, a time in which Jesus institutes something much, much bigger to his people. I wanted Nigel to read that passage to you, please. Can I, can I use this? Oh, okay, praise the Lord. All right, so let me read it from Luke chapter 22, uh, verses, uh, starting at verse 15. It says, And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Those who are helping serve communion, if you wouldn't mind come on, coming on up.
Everybody else, I'd, I'd like for us to just bow our heads for a minute and pray silently. Paul talks about the possibility and even the habit that some people were in of doing what he called partaking of the body and blood of Christ unworthily. And I've known some folks who wouldn't take communion at all because they felt unworthy to do it. And of course, we're all unworthy. But, but what Paul is talking about is being at peace with one another, addressing the sin that's in our lives. So in the quiet of the moment as we're praying silently, I want to invite you to just do a little inventory of your heart. Ask what's outstanding between you and God. What needs to be addressed? How you can address those things by acknowledging them before God and confessing them. Sure, he knows they're there. That's not really the point. The point is, have you acknowledged them and confessing them before him? Acknowledging not just that there is some vague notion called sin in your life, but acknowledging specific things in your life that are sinful and addressing them before God. In the silence, for just a few minutes, I invite you to pray. process ended with just an acknowledgement of sin how hopeless it would be but it doesn't you died on the cross the perfect sacrifice to take that sin from us to cleanse us and prepare us to become more like you dear God I ask you to once again and anew cleanse the hearts of your people. Draw us close to you. Like Peter, we submit ourselves for your cleansing. And we partake of these elements in that spirit. Father, bless this feast. May this cup, may this bread be more than food in our mouth, but nourishment to our souls. In Jesus' name. necessarily planning on. So join in or listen as we take communion. Yeah. 
says the cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ and the bread that we break is it not a participation in the body of Christ because there is one bread we who are many are one body for we all partake of one bread Oh God, once again, we receive your sacrifice. Accept your grace. Build in us the image of Christ in every way. In Jesus' name, amen.
as less. Oh God, how I need you. And I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. All to Jesus. devoted like a ring of solid gold like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old and your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today faithful you 
faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. And you shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. You're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes. And you will have your bride, free of all the God, as we go, help us to remember you, help us to grow in you, help us to do the things that we know that we need to do. Oh God, and as you show us and you grow us, make us more and more and more closer to the image of you, of Jesus, of Christ. as we show love, as we exhibit a peace that passes all understanding, God. Help us to show your good news, your goodness, your greatness, to be a witness in this world, this confusing and sometimes so dark world. God, go with us. God, be with us and help us. We go in your peace. We go in your grace and help us go with our praise, with your praise always on our lips. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.